Uh, yeah. Well, welcome everyone in uh, polyvagal um the uh, polyvagal theory informed that's the thing um series. And today we have Deb Dana, which I would say uh, the you know the mother of polyvagal. If Stephen, <laughs> Dr. Stephen Porges is the father and developer, I think Deb is the mother. Um, Deb is a clinician and consultant uh, specializing in using the lens of the polyvagal theory to understand and resolve the impact of trauma and create ways of working that honor the role of the autonomic nervous system. And I'm reading this from your book, Anchored. Uh -huh. And I have to say, Deb, you're everywhere. I have the cards, <laughs> have oh, this good book, Lord. and the oh, other Lord. books. But um, since I'm using this book, which is yeah. really, really nice, um, mm. can you explain or elaborate on, on the word anchored? Because I personally love, and I started using anchored more mm. than grounded. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so, like, I like anchored more than grounded too. Grounded um, for me has, and people use it, which is fine. But for me, it never fit. It felt like I was stuck somewhere. I'm grounded. I'm, I'm here. And, and um, as I say in the book, I grew up um, around the ocean. Mm. Um, and, and for me, you know, being out um, in the ocean meant we needed an anchor, but an anchor I love because it keeps you connected to the sea bottom. So you're safely held there, but the anchor road allows you to move. Um, which for me is a sense of being in ventral. I'm anchored in ventral, but I, I have room to move. I can feel all sorts of different flavors of ventral. And even if I get pulled away, I find my way back. So that's why I love anchored. And I do, it's a word I've used forever in my work. And when we were thinking, what should be the title of this book? It was like, well, anchored, I use it all the time. Why not? So, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's uh, it's a lovely book, and I it's funny. I I gave it to someone. I and I told them, uh, you know, uh, this is a good intro for polyvagal theory, and it's easy to read. And two days later, he brought back the book. He said, you know, this is complicated, and I was like, okay, yeah. so still not... a little complicated. It's just a complicated topic, isn't it? Our our <laughs> nervous system, and and you know, when I wrote Anchored, my team at Sounds True wanted me not to use um, the biological terms, to use ventral sympathetic dorsal or, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to make this accessible to, for everyday people, but I think everyday people need to know this language. And so we kept it in and at the end of my time, at the end of the whole process, they said, we're so glad you kept it in because now we all speak that language in, in the office. So it's a little hard to get into but once you're there it becomes pretty easy to navigate absolutely and i think it took me i say about two three years of reading and listening to the same stuff over and over till i um i and that's why it's like yeah this is an easy read it, to me it was a very uh, smooth thing and um you know i think one of the things that i absolutely loved and it helped me you know um grasp and and understand myself and my autonomic nervous system is the mapping of the nervous system. And I uh, I can't say how much I love how you make it very personal, mm -hmm. but I do find that, yes, using the biological terms, it brings a common language, but then everyone can have their own language, their own mm -hmm. title, their, the, the way they want to describe it, which is very, very personal. But let's, um, you know, get into the, you know, the more the topic that I really want to get into is, you know, being polyvagal informed. And mm -hmm. we're today we're talking more in the clinical practice. A lot of the um, most of the audience are either, you know, therapists, clinicians, uh, counselors. Uh, what does it mean and why do why, why, why it's important? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's all sorts of language. You know, I use polyvagal informed or polyvagal guided or, you know, a polyvagal perspective. I mean, there are lots of ways to think about it, but I think for me, the, the, the foundation is I'm engaging with my client's nervous system. And so it is important for me to understand how the nervous system works and how our nervous systems are um, communicating. Because no matter what model of therapy I'm using, I still am engaging with the nervous system, right? You can't get away 
from working with the nervous system. So many of us aren't trained to work with the nervous system. Many models of therapy don't, you know, they don't bring it in, right? And I'm trained in a whole bunch of other things and nothing really spoke directly to, oh, here's what's happening in the nervous system. And once I could layer that underneath and become, you know, guided by how the nervous system works using Steve's beautiful organizing principles, then my work using other models was better, right? Because I knew why it worked. I knew when we got stuck, what I needed to do. So I think that's probably the reason I think people should really understand the nervous system and our nervous system is impacting our client's nervous system moment to moment. And if I don't understand how that's working, I don't know how to change it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in a, in a therapy room, what, you know, I've seen you do beautiful demos mm -hmm. and you know, it's, um, you know, we're not going to do a demo right now, uh, but it's how, you know, because we, as you said, we're not trained or uh, I'm not a therapist, but many are not trained in that. But what does it look like in the, in the, in the session room? What, what would the therapist be doing to honor their nervous system and their clients? You know, I think when we work in a polyvagal informed way, you know, several things happen differently. One is um, we don't um, use a strict protocol because as soon as we move into there's step, you know, one to four that I need to do, then I've lost the communication with my client's nervous system, right? My client's nervous system might say, well, I like one and two, but I'm not ready to do three and don't even think about four. But if I'm guided by a protocol, I don't recognize that, right? So one of the things that's really helpful is, is, you know, I'm always listening to my client's nervous system to see, is it saying yes to what I'm inviting? And we have to remember, it has to be an invitation always to a nervous system. As soon as we make it a demand or a should or a have to sort of situation, the nervous system feels that and, and oftentimes goes into a survival response. For most of our trauma survivor clients, as soon as there's a demand, they, they it feels dangerous and they go to a survival response. So the language is important, the invitation, the, uh, the I don't have an agenda. You know, if we do step one and two, great. If we do step one, great. If we do no step at all, we are going to honor what your nervous system is saying yes to today. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is when we work this way, we have to be really intimately connected to what's happening in our system. And I think we need to be more transparent in what's happening with our clients, because if I get distracted for a moment, that biological rudeness even that we talked about, you know, if I don't name it with my client, their nervous system feels it anyway. And it may not rise to the level of their conscious awareness, but their nervous system marks it and their brain begins to make up a story. Right. Oh, Deb doesn't really want to be here today or Deb's tired of working with me or for many of my clients, I'm too broken to be fixed. Right. So get that biological rudeness or perhaps something that my client is saying touches my system in a way that that pulls me too deep into my own survival pattern. And then I come back. I name that with my client. I think it's important because their nervous system knows it, whether I name it or not. And with trauma survivors, their experience is they're told what's happening isn't really happening, or they're told don't listen to what's happening in here. It's not, not true, right? So when I say, oh, I just got really pulled into my own story for a moment, but now I'm back. I discovered early on my clients would say, thank you for telling me that. Because now that we're reflecting on it, I noticed something, but I didn't know what it was. Right. And they, the other thing they also would say over and over was, I'm so glad to know you're human. I said, yep, human, <laughs> just like you. My nervous system is organized just like yours. Hopefully I'm a little more skilled at coming to regulation and staying there. But I, too, have my moments when I get pulled into survival or pulled out of connection. And I'm going to name that with my clients so that they know it, so that they explicitly know it right because they implicitly feel it i want them to explicitly know it so i think those are the two things that that are so different when we work this way yeah can we talk a little bit about biological rudeness because we, we both know what it is 
<laughs> probably yeah. a lot of our listeners um, don't. Yeah. So biological rudeness is is uh, you know I actually had this experience at a at a yoga class the other day when it it was it was the only second time I'd been to this class and I found it a challenging class. And after class, the teacher um, was asking me, you know, my experience, and I was just starting to talk with her. And all of a sudden, she, she started looking over my shoulder at one of her familiar students and, and smiled at that student. And my nervous system felt, oh, I don't matter. Mm -hmm. That's biological rudeness. She came back, but it didn't matter. My nervous system already had that moment of disconnect. So when we look over somebody or through somebody or for therapists the famous thing with therapists is looking at your watch or looking at the clock mm -hmm. right and and we we try to sneak it in with you know like i'm wearing a watch here and i'm trying to go you know without my client knowing and i learned again early on to just say you know i'm just going to check the time so that we keep track of where we are in our session. And then I would look at the clock on my watch. But if I don't do that, again, the nervous system registers, she just went away, right? I'm not important or whatever the story is that's gonna go along with it. That's biological rudeness. Yeah. yeah the, the common things that just happen in the course of a day. Hmm? Yeah, and, and, and noticing that it's happening and, and trying maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> unsuccessfully most of the time, not going to the story. And, right. Um, right, because we're 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 storytelling beings. That's what humans are. We're meaning making creatures, and we do that through story. And what the brain's job is is to make a story that makes some kind of sense of what's felt in the nervous system. Hmm. Right. And so the story that comes isn't, oh, you know, she's just looking at one of her old friends who's a student. And she's not ignoring me. She'll be right back. She just got pulled away for a moment. That's not the story my brain makes up. In the moment, my brain says, oh, I'm not important and I'm not going back to this class. Right? <laughs> it's a survival response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's not intentional. Um, nope. that, and yeah, our brain can create the, the most, you know, fabulous dramatic stories and we yeah. can find evidence to do that. And Absolutely. So let me ask you, because this gets asked all the time, state follow story, or is it story that follows state? Story follows state, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, you know, the, the information, you know, we, we know that the vagal pathway, 80% of the information comes from the body to the brain, 20% is a response back. That information that gets fed up to the brain, then the brain tries to make some sort of sense, tries to organize it in some way that we might move through the world, move through our day. And the way it does that is by making story. And when we have the same things over and over and over, it makes beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Stories and then beliefs, right? So, so I have a story about, um, you know, if we, we take, you know, my poor yoga instructor, if we take her, I have a story about her, but then I might, if it keeps happening, I have a story about yoga instructors or I have a story about my place in the world, it becomes a belief, right? And then that's going to prevent me from trying another class or doing other things because a story that's repeated over and over just becomes a belief about the world and me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I want to go back to the um, naming for, you know, for therapists because, you know, we're, you know, therapists are human after all. Who, who who knew that? Uh, but you know, because life happens, and sometimes things you know we're we're taking out of our ventral, and mm -hmm. then you know you know a client comes in, mm -hmm. and for many, I think without having this uh, understanding that the nervous system detects, we'll try to kind of muster it in and override. Yes. Yeah. How yeah. is that um, affecting, and is it? something you know easy i don't know if it's easy for therapists to say hey i've had a bad day or something is that necessary to do every time you know it's it's interesting and again there's a lot of clinical wisdom that goes into this what i do know is that unless i am regulated enough i don't have to be fully immersed in ventral but i have to have a critical mass of ventral circulating in my system so that i am sending a welcome and I'm a cue of safety for my client. If that's not the case, I need to do something. Mm -hmm. I either need to, um, you know, t tell my client, and you know, I would tell my client. I, I had a, 
I had a full-time practice when my husband had a stroke and immediately um, the world turned upside down. And I saw very few clients for a while and there were many mornings when I would get to the office and it would have been a very challenging experience to get there. And I would simply tell my clients, you know, it's been kind of a messy morning. Can we just take a moment and both of us arrive in Ventral? They don't need to know why it was messy or the details. They need me to acknowledge out loud it was messy because they're feeling it Mm -hmm. coming from my nervous system. So oftentimes, I'm probably more someone who will name um, with my clients, you know, the, the, you know, oh, I, my sympathetic just pulled me away for a moment, but now I'm back. Because what happens is you can say, you know, did you feel me get pulled away? That's a clinical experience, right? Did you feel me? Many people have, you know, cut off no awareness. Yeah. If my client says no, I say, oh, let's play with that. Let me make it really big and see if you can feel it, right? Because that becomes a, an intervention we're doing together. The other thing is, did you, can you feel that I'm back now? Because many, many clients can feel the going away and have no awareness that someone comes back. So even if I name it, you know, I get pulled away and now and I'm back, not the details of why they don't need to know that my grocery list just came in <laughs> to my brain, right? You know, they need to know it got pulled away and came back and then they can feel it. They, and they get the sense of, oh, people do come back. I can notice they go and come and Deb knows how to come back to regulation. That's what we're trying to help our clients trust and then experience themselves. If we're in the middle of some deep processing moment and I get pulled away because of what's going on or for whatever reason, I may decide I'm not mentioning it in that moment because the deep processing is going on. It didn't feel like it was interrupted, but the next week I'm going to come back and I'm going to name it the next week. We were in the middle of a really beautiful moment. You were processing this deep experience and I got pulled away for just a moment and came back and I wanted to name that now because I'm sure it registered somewhere below the level of the awareness. So I just wanted to name it, right? Yeah, I, I found, you know, uh, mapping the, the the states, even during the day and, and the more, um, I, I don't know how many times I've done the map and every time there's <laughs> something different. And, and I find that even, you know, one of our, our attendees, she said, you know, that's what she does with client. And I, I, I almost want to do that mapping exercise with everyone I see because, and there's always a nuance of like, oh, this is what I do when this happened. And I know you, um, you speak a lot about home away from home when we are getting stuck. So, but I don't know if that resonated, but I found that my home away from home depends on the situation, depends on the interaction. So where with some individuals depends on where, who they are, my home away from home is different. And it's lovely to begin to, to feel the, the um, nuance of that and to be, see, are there categories, right? Is my home away from home sympathetic when I'm in connection with people in my family or coworkers, or we begin to be curious about what makes the difference because that just gives us more information about our nervous system patterns. And I think that's a really lovely um, way to go deeper into, you know, knowing exactly how your nervous system responds. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, one of the things that really made it, you know, is dorsal. No, knowing that I'm okay. So this is, I'm being pulled in dorsal. It's not, that I don't want to get up or work or do anything is like my system is moving towards dorsal. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, even with, with moving towards sympathetic, I found it to be, you know, like almost magic that as soon as I'm naming it Mm -hmm. and I'm acknowledging, Oh, so this is what's happening. Then that acknowledgement of itself is a, is a ventral it, it pulls me right. back to ventral right so right. Yeah. what what happens with that with naming well, and, the, and honoring the, that? the notice and name experience you can't notice a name if you are fully in a survival state because your prefrontal is not allowing you access to that so even the practice of notice and naming 
brings a drop of ventral in every time. Mm -hmm. and, and once that happens, it begins to interrupt the automaticity of the survival pattern. And that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, well, I, I do know the times where I know I'm fully unsympathetic and there's that voice that's trying to pop on and, and, and say, hey, you're, you're moving too fast. Uh, right. But it just, yeah. sometimes it, it doesn't happen. Um, right. uh, I, I was having a conversation with Randall from the Polyvagal Institute uh, the other day, and um, he was mentioning, uh, I was, we were talking about the window of tolerance, and he said, you know, I, he, you have different views on the window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. So what what do you think of it or how, you know, where does it yeah. sit or not? Yeah, I, mean, I think the window of tolerance is a brilliant um, creation by Dan Siegel mm -hmm. long, long time ago now. And, and um, I'm sensory motor trained, so Pat Ogden uses window of tolerance mm -hmm. in sensory motor, so very familiar. And I was trained in window of tolerance before I ever discovered Steve's work. And window of tolerance works absolutely beautifully. The, the the difference, I think, between the window of tolerance and the hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, so I created the latter, but any way we use the hierarchy is that the window puts ventral in the middle mm -hmm. with sympathetic on top and dorsal on the bottom. So it, it leads you to believe you can return from dorsal directly to ventral and you can't do that. So mm -hmm. the only reason we use the hierarchy is it respects the way we move in and out of these states. So window is fine. It, it's doing the same thing. Window is ventral, hypersympathetic, hypo is dorsal. It just, for me, it's like, oh, it's in the wrong order now, right? Oh. And I need to put it in the right order. So all of my clients were window, you know, trained because that's what we were using. And when I discovered Steve's work and created the ladder, we, we then used the ladder. And it was interesting because most of the, it was an easy transition for most of them. Mm. And many of them said, makes so much sense because mm -hmm. I don't come back from dorsal right to feeling great, right? I often get activated and, 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 you know, it gets very messy. And now I know why, because I have to come through some form of mobilization to get back there. Mm. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's good. I have, I have two graphs with the, with the window of tolerance and, um, um, and the polyvagal, it just kind of, um, I think for me, the window of tolerance, uh, because it helps me measure where I am right now, what is my, how much ventral I have right now and how much I could add on or not. And, um, you know, I find it really fascinating that we are, we think we are, we are complex creature and we think we're very intelligent, yet something as simple as being hungry or not mm -hmm. having enough sleep mm -hmm. and shift this yep. whole thing, uh, you know, <laughs> takes and, us and think, to yeah, survival and, right away. Right. And I, I have these two slides I love that I've been using recently. It says, you know, that, you know, that, that, you know, the nervous system doesn't make meaning, doesn't assign motivation. It simply enacts a response. And this is not a cognitive response. It's a biological one. And I love that to remind ourselves that, oh, this is a biological choice. It's not a cognitive decision that's happening. It's a biological one that's that's going on. And then when I can bring awareness to it, then I can engage my brain and body to help me move. Yeah. And I find it because all humans have a nervous system. All mammals have a nervous system. Mm -hmm. So that levels the, you know, the playing field of, you know, I don't need to really know the story or what caused the system to be in a, you know, stuck in, you know, survival. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. Um, it, well, it, it matters in, at some point, but to, you know, for me to see, and I think it's a, a lens that, you know, glasses that I have that sometimes like even watching movies or listening to music, it's like, oh, this person or this is like, they must have been in this kind of state. Mm. It's, uh, it's so fun to look at other people like that and think, well, I wonder what state they're in. Mm. Right. And when we're working with our clients, you know, in, in some ways, the story is so less important than what their nervous system response was to the story. And I've worked with so many trauma survivors who are so relieved to know, I don't need to know your story. It's not, it, 
we can, but it's not necessary. What's necessary is to help you find regulation in your nervous system. And as that happens and you bring some ventral, you know, back to reflecting on a prior experience, things change. It, you know, it is, it's pretty amazing what can happen without my ever knowing the details of a story. And many trauma survivors don't know the details of their story anyway. Mm. Right? It's a pre-verbal story or it's a story that has no, no memory marking in their system. And so it's lovely to know we don't have to know in order to heal. Uh, well, that, that would be contrary to many therapists and training who are trained in the talking therapy and, you know, um, putting meaning to, to, to these things. How do you see it in the field of therapy? And, you know, how is that, you know, well, it's, coming it's, together or is it coming together? <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, the body oriented therapies and the you know, movement therapies and dance movement have probably known this forever, that mm -hmm. the story is held in the body and we don't have to, you know, the brain puts language to it, but they're, you know, not necessary to re-language. I do love, I call it restorying, you know, that after we have reorganized the nervous system, then let's spend some time listening to the new story. But the story is one that emerges from that reorganized nervous system, not from the top down, but it's a, you know, body and brain cooperate, you know, okay, in this new way, my nervous system is organized. What's the story now? So I do, you know, we humans love story. We need story. Story is important, right? At some point, it just depends where, where do we put the emphasis on it? And I don't tend to put the emphasis on knowing the details of what happened to my client in their trauma. I want to know how did your nervous system respond? Right. Even when you're doing initial assessment and they're talking to you about their childhood growing up, you know, I'm, I'm curious with them. So were you the kid that got big and acted out or ran away all the time? Or were you the kid that got really quiet and tried to be invisible? That's what I want to know. Mm. That's, mm. Um, you know, going back to um, sessions and safety in sessions, uh, you said, you know, intentionally get clients to cues of safety. And I've seen you in your demos, even the simplest thing is, as asking about, you know, the distance of, you know, how far the client is sitting, where they are sitting. And I, I know you, there depends on the flexibility of the room of how mm -hmm. much yeah. we can uh, go. Some people would say, well, you know, I can't have the client come and change everything. Um, right. where, where is the middle ground with, with, with that? Uh, you know, so I can't, you know, if, I, if I'm in a session, I tell you, hey, Deb, I don't like that figure in the back. Could you please remove it? That That's also, you know, might not be a doable. Where, where is the middle of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the first, the first is, oh, you, you noticed your nervous system was sending you that message mm. and you named it out loud. I mean, that's brilliant. That is so powerful in the beginning. Then we can figure out, okay, what might we do? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't repaint the color of my wall. I, I get that it is. So how might we come to an agreement with your nervous system? What would be a way that it would be okay enough to stay working in this room? And, you know, it's interesting because I, I had a client um, who had a, a specific object mm -hmm. that it, it, it just activated her survival response. Right. And, you know, if we just moved it out of the way a little bit, just moved it over a little, it was great. Mm -hmm. Or if she sat in a different seat, so she wasn't looking at it, that was great, right? Because it was not something I could take out of my office, right? You know, sometimes they're easy things. I can put, you know, I had a client, the cushion was a trigger, put it in the closet, didn't matter, right? Sometimes there are things, but it's in the naming of it, the knowing, oh, this is what happens around that, that object, that smell, that sound whatever it is, because once we identify it, then we can begin to say, so what can we do with this? Right? Well, you know, I think with the majority of people, I'd say completely disconnected from even noticing, the, you know, that doesn't happen. And the more I do this work and find, you know, the glimmers that you talk mm -hmm. about, the more um, I do pay attention to what's on my desk, what putting the things that I like, what do I need to kind of regulate, regulate look at the window. Mm -hmm. But how do, you know, without noticing, so I could be in a place where, 
there is a terrible something that is mm -hmm. you know affecting my nervous system mm -hmm. but i'm not aware of noticing that so the first thing to do is to notice your nervous system right and you go oh i'm feeling a little uneasy mm -hmm. right and then to become curious about i wonder what it is is it because again neuroception inside my body is just something going on here mm -hmm. outside in the environment or between me and another nervous system and so you can begin to take a survey of those places inside out in the environment and between me and another and then you usually can come to oh i really don't like that yeah right. or oh i'm really hungry or whatever it is but you just first have to notice something feels a little off for me and mm -hmm. then you can use those three categories to begin to take a take a survey of oh let's see you know what is it yeah. one of the things that kind of made me feel uneasy and I didn't know what it is okay. um, and then understanding more about you know ventral and the social engagement and the facial muscles is are people who are really having a lot of you know plastic surgery and and procedures on their face yep. and I, I and there are few individuals who are really unanimated yep. and I felt like I don't feel good about around this person. I don't know why. I don't like the way they talk. And then I'm the more I'm starting to notice is like, oh no, this, you know, this area doesn't move. This area doesn't move. Right. And my nervous system is registering it as, you know, what well, what is going on with that person? So how right. do you because it's a big thing all over and people, I don't think people you know, do understand what it means to have right. those kind of things that, you know, create that um, autonomic right. response with others. Right, right. And I love that. I don't know if you had that question uh, <laughs> before, but it... I, I haven't, you know, it's interesting because it's both people who have plastic surgery and there was some research study and I don't remember where I read it even, but the, one of the unintended consequences was that the people who had plastic surgery were struggling more to come into relationship and people on the other end, like you were talking, were struggling to feel connected because we aren't getting the signals that we're supposed to be getting from a movable face. You know, the other place we see that, and, and again, it's a personal experience that, you know, many people have is, is um, you know, someone whose face becomes less movable or distorted because of accident or illness or injury. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, Bob's face post stroke is, is, you know, ve not very movable, mm -hmm. right? My nervous system, we're, we're eight years in now and my nervous system still has that moment of, uh, right? And, and then I can, I can bring my awareness to it and go, oh, right, it has nothing to do with what he thinks about me. It's simply the artifacts of a stroke, his face doesn't move. But we have to override it because I'm not sure my nervous system is ever going to, you know, not respond it responds less intensely yeah. but so there are people walking around who through what for whatever reason are giving off cues of danger to other nervous systems simply because their face doesn't move or people who are in neck braces or or um whose necks who can't you know move like this it's a cue of danger an unmoving head cue of danger and it may have nothing to do with anything except that i have a stiff neck or i'm in a a neck brace Right. It's, it's so fascinating when you know what the cues of danger are, you can begin to um, work around them, I suppose, is what we're we're trying to do. Tone of voice. Yeah. Tone of voice is either a welcome or a warning and tone of voice. I worked with a colleague who was had a fairly monotone, flat voice. Mm -hmm. um, she was a brilliant clinician, but she had her own you know, long um, trauma history in a monotone voice, sort of a dorsal energy. And she couldn't keep clients mm. because because of that, not because she wasn't a gifted clinician, but because her voice was sent a warning to her client's nervous system. So fascinating, you know. You know, so, someone listening to this would would can easily go in a in a panic. Cause, oh my goodness, I'm I'm sending all cues of danger. I'm I'm I need to be changing this. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing, what I'm saying, it, and and that of itself. And I'm just saying that, and I feel that. Yes. Oh my goodness, let's not stop this therapy business and and, and go do something. 
<laughs> much easier. Uh. Um, and how 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 is it? And I and, and it's you know how do how do you deal with that or how do you address that with someone who's just coming into this work and hearing, oh, I you know I need to be doing all that. Well, I I have an exercise that I do with clients, and I you know invite everybody in my trainings to do too. It's like we we want to get to know how do we send welcomes and warnings with our eyes, with our voice with our gestures, with our movements, because we do it, you know, just organically all the time, right? And, and the intonation of your voice is a reflection of what your nervous system state is, yeah. right? And so if you are regulated, your voice is going to send that message out into the world. And I sometimes joke and I say, if you are regulated, you can say most anything to somebody else because they will receive it from the ventral energy and they will be able to engage in the conversation with you. So for people who are, you know, just coming into this work, the first thing we want to do is learn, you know, what is our ventral like? How do we get there? Because everything else is going to follow along from that. From that. Yeah. And, you know, kids, baby, the younger they are, are very good um, clues to what state a person is. So maybe put that, you know, kid, they they respond to that nervous system right away and mm -hmm. that tone of voice and the look of the eye and, and, oh, every, yeah. you know, and it could be, you know, saying the most loving thing and they would not uh, respond. Um, mm -hmm. I want to open it. If anyone has a question, if you want to type the question in the chat or come on video and ask um, Deb your questions, um, please go ahead. We're still going to continue our, um, mm. uh, our chat. Um, yeah, it's, um, and I, I what, again, <laughs> 101 reasons why I love polyvagal and how it made my life a lot easier is that it's, it takes out the, what, what Steve says, you know, the intentionality yeah. of it's not personal, you know, I am, um, um, you know, someone is saying something or I am doing something and I went into, you know, sympathetic or dorsal and I'm not a bad person, right? Um, right. You know, it's it's we all go through this. I you know I think today I, I spend the most of the day jumping up and down between a ventral and sympathetic. Uh, probably maybe at the end of the day we'll we'll move into dorsal, but um, it's that's what happens. Like oh okay, so I moved into sympathetic. Yeah okay, let's just just yeah. move on instead of getting stuck with that and it also knowing that the the story follows state mm -hmm. i became really aware of, of like oh so sometimes i would notice the story it's like oh okay so this is my dorsal story mm -hmm. so this is where i'm at i'll just have to um let it go and yeah i <laughs> it's it's, sure it's everyone yeah. has a lot of people have questions they don't want to uh, uh give oh, okay <laughs> but we're gonna keep going on but please do it yeah oh Aisha you you uh have a question and I think she's Aisha is a therapist from Bahrain I'll add her spotlight and oh ask I get to you. talk to her yay yes hi, yeah, hi um I um I'm really glad you mentioned kind of bringing in drops of ventral into other states because um, I find a lot of people talk about the states as if they kind of exist separately. Um, and I'm really curious to hear about how you integrate different modalities with polyvagal theory, because when I think of bringing in drops of ventral, I almost conceptualize it from an IFS framework and think of it as a part coming in. I'd just be curious to hear about how you work with it and think about it. And IFS is a is an easy integration with polyvagal, and I'm actually trained IFS too, so it's I was always doing the two of those together. I think when I think about parts, I think about parts that live in the different states. And so if I am in ventral, all of the parts of me that, that carry that ventral energy are, are available, accessible. And, and maybe, you know, one part leads me one place and another part leads me another, but it's all within that ventral landscape. When I move to sympathetic or dorsal, I think that that then opens the door for all of the 
parts that live in sympathetic and live in dorsal to come out and take over. So for me, it's not that a, um, it's not that a, um, my, um, firefighter has come out and then I go to the state. It's that I've gone to the state that's allowed the firefighter to come out. So that, that's how I, you know, sort of envision, um, states and parts um, working together. And then if we bring a a drop of ventral, Dick would call it self-energy, right? Ventral, one of the aspects of ventral is self-energy. Oftentimes, I think what what needs to happen is if I am pulled into a uh, an exile, say, right? I'm pulled into a dorsal exile. I think our exiles live in dorsal. I'm pulled to dorsal to to an exile that's, that's stuck there. And, you know, if I can, you know, anchor in ventral, which is, you know, what I talk about, anchor in ventral, and then bring that ventral energy to the part that's in dorsal and do nothing but bring the energy, you know, things begin to change, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a more generalized way, I think, of working with parts. I don't always have to go be with the part witness it, have it unburden, you know, all of that. I don't have to do all that. Sometimes there's there's incredible power in being in the presence of ventral, mm-hmm. right? There's incredible power, whether that's another person, whether that's a part. And amazing things happen when you bring ventral to um, a place that, that ventral hasn't been, right? If we think about our, our traumas, when we're in a trauma, we're by ourselves. So I often work with people who, you know, the one that comes to mind was, you know, a dorsal um, cave. And there was a part at the very end of that dorsal cave all alone. And all we did was go and stand at the mouth of the cave with, you know, anchored in ventral and let that ventral energy find its way into the cave. We didn't do anything else. We didn't, we didn't go to, we didn't anything. And that exile who was stuck there all alone had an amazing experience because it, it was not alone any longer, right? And so it, it, it's interesting when you begin to work, weave it into other modalities that, that you're still doing the work, but you're adding in this understanding, this awareness that ventral is, is a powerful, powerful intervention in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's comforting to hear. I often find my imposter syndrome comes in going, is it really that simple? Like, is it really working? <laughs> you know, and so it's comforting to hear you validate that. It, it, it does. And, and I think, you know, it is simple, not easy, right? Mm-hmm. Right. It, it's hard to to be anchored in ventral in the face of, you know, things that are going on in our lives or, or in sessions with our clients. And yet, if we truly learn, you know, to be able to to be in ventral and, you know, allow that ventral energy to connect with our client. Um, I tell people, if you do nothing else, do that, right? If you, because I work with, with, you know, people who are just out of school and aren't trained in any models. They're trained in a, in a way, but not a model. And they worry they aren't going to be able to do anything. I said, the most powerful thing you can do is be a predictably regulated ventral energy for your client, because that's probably a missing experience for them. So, yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Aisha. Um, Yeah. You know, having the, what happened to my thingy? Um, uh, yeah, it wouldn't work. And it's stuck on you, Aisha. It wants you to stay in the spotlight. Okay, uh, you stay. Well, yeah. it is, is, you know, really, you know, putting that, you know, for myself, that um, cues of safety of, or glimmers that could be, um, you know, um, all over the, the place to mm-hmm. remind us to bring... Um, you know, bring us back in ventral. And we have another question from Hind from Qatar. Yes. I'll... Yes. Hello. Thanks, Manal. Uh, hi, Deb. How are you? Hi, Hind. I'm good. How are you? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Lebanon and uh, I'm living in Qatar at the moment. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So uh, first, I'd like to start by saying thank you and uh, thanks to Steve as well, because um, uh, your work has impacted me greatly. Uh, I've been studying the polyvagal theory for the past two years, and um, 
I'm happily saying that I'm, I'm coming out slowly and gradually from freeze and uh, life has been very good lately. Oh, I'm um, so glad. Let's, yeah. let, let's stop and just savor that for a moment, right? That's really yes. lovely. That's lovely. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and uh, I'm just very grateful and happy to be here talking to you face to face. I mean, I watch your recordings. I'm always, <laughs> uh, you know, the time zones and time difference. Right. But uh, now that I'm uh, live with you, and thanks for Manal for this opportunity. So my question is about procrastination. Mm. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, from you from a polyvagal lens, please. Yeah, it's interesting because procrastination can be a sympathetic. Um, survival response, or it can be a dorsal survival response. So I love that you, you know, ask about it because if a client comes to me and I do get asked about procrastination a lot, it must be a common problem in the world today, I guess. If a client comes and talks about procrastination, I say, so which state is it emerging from? Because procrastination can be an active um, distraction or an active um, not doing or an active, um, um, always editing, but never getting it finished, right? That sort of thing. And that active energy that pushes, pushes, pushes um, either toward, but never finishing or away. So I can't concentrate on is sympathetic survival energy, right? There's also a dorsal procrastination where I just don't have the energy to even pick up the, the pen and begin. Right. And it's a very different experience. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to discover which state is it coming from? Because if it's a sympathetic, too much energy, I've got the energy I need, but it's all over the place. Then my job is to help my client organize that energy. So it moves them toward a purpose, right? If it's dorsal and I just don't have the energy to even think about starting, it's a very different intervention. It's how do we begin to bring some energy in slowly and so that we might take a gentle step toward even thinking about, right? So again, it's, it's, it's not procrastination per se, it's what flavor of procrastination are, are we trying to, um, trying to work with? And that's the same that's true for anything that, that that a client brings, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I had a week where I was really sad. The client might tell me, I say, Oh, tell me more, you know, how much of that sadness emerged from sympathetic and how much emerged from dorsal or how much of that sadness came from a place of being anchored in ventral. Right. Right. So it's, it, it, it I love when, when people ask about something, cause then we can explore more. We can be curious. Yeah. Yeah, it makes total sense. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. You're welcome. That's a very good question, Hint. Uh, it's it's interesting to look at things, you know, uh, procrastination, I would think dorsal right away. I would not go to, you know, think of sympathetic. And, you know, even, you know, with sadness, it does not come to me as, you know, in sympathetic energy, but it's, it's, it becomes more interesting to explore those mm -hmm. everything basically we can put it somewhere on that ladder and that and that's true everything is somewhere on that ladder which i love you know i was thinking about the procrastination i, I often struggle to finish something i procrastinate around finishing which mm -hmm. is a sympathetic experience for me because the and you know I, you can ask yourself like two questions you ask so like what, what is this procrastination protecting you from? That's the first question. So if my procrastinating around finishing is protecting me from having my work out there in the world where people can read it and, and comment on it, right? <laughs> so that's the protection. It's protecting me from something worse. Our nervous system is always protecting us from something worse, right? And then the other question is, what is it keeping you from? What ventral moment is it keeping you from? My procrastination and not finishing is keeping me from having the joy of having my work out there, right? So it, it, it's both. And we can use those two questions with most anything. You know, if you stepped out of this pattern, what worst thing might happen? If you stepped out of this pattern, what, what you know, ventral experience might occur? And that's really what's happening all the time. Thank you, Hint. Yeah, it's... Um... I, I, because there's always this, you know, a pattern 
I like how, you know, if this pattern stops, it could, it could go either way. We always, I think we're very hopeful in nature of thinking that if, if I would stop this pattern, you know, good things would happen, but we, we don't look at the, what? Well, your your brain might be hopeful. Your nervous system is going to err on the side of survival. And so your sympathetic system usually says something in the realm of if you weren't doing this, some dorsal thing would come in, right? Because part of sympathetic's job is to keep you out of dorsal hopelessness, despair, you know, giving up, right? That's part of its job. And so when you say, well, if you stopped doing this dor sympathetic thing, sympathetic goes, no, no, you're not going to ventral, you're going to dorsal, and that's worse. So yeah, <laughs> let's just keep doing this thing, even though it's not getting us where we want to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very uh, complex creatures. Um, I, you know, when you were talking about giving that, you know, ventral, and I think that's something, even not in a clinical setting. Mm because we all have individuals in our lives that they're, you know, they're stuck in either dorsal or sympathetic, dysregulated, unaware of what the hell is the nervous system is to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, as a bystander or someone who would, you know, we're not gonna go into a clinical setting or what is it, how much of, of it can we, you know, support them in? Yeah. You know, a number of things come to mind. One is simply seeing them as dysregulated rather than, you know, dangerous or um, um, intentionally trying to hurt me, right? I just, oh, they're dysregulated. They are unable to show up and talk with me. They are unable to behave in a, in a different way, right? Not unwilling, but unable. And that begins to change the way I see um, others. I, I think, you know, there's a there's a just like me practice that, that, that we do, you know, just like me, this person um, can shut down and disappear. Mm. Right? Because again, we all have the same experience. So, so if you pick the things that happen to you regularly and say, well, just like me, that person can do the same. It begins to bring us together in that way. And then the other thing that, that, you know, if we go back to the power of ventral, as I'm moving through the world, I am sending cues to other nervous systems, it, not even people I'm directly in contact with, but just people that I pass by. And if I am regulated, I am sending a message to another nervous system that there is, you know, hope, possibility, regulation, safety, you know, around, right? And the same is true if I'm moving through the world in fight, flight, or, or collapse, shutdown, I'm sending a very different message. Right. So one of the things I say is we're responsible for the autonomic information that we're putting out into the world. Yeah, um, I the, a question that I had wanted to ask you earlier on, because, you know, we have we don't have much time, but we want to I think you'd have a very good, you know, short answer to or um, um, is is it, to me what it looks like to me or feels like is that you know not not necessarily ventral um you know state but the social engagement that is is responding out of fear of you know wanting to to please and i know there's um you know um you i'm talking about you know and 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 steve about appeasement mm -hmm. uh, and where a lot of people would you know label it as fawning and you know mm -hmm. We had that discussion, um, you know, in October, we kind of, it, yeah. it makes sense to me, but is that, is that our ventral or social engagement? Does it, does it happen in ventral, uh, the, the, in survival, yeah. does our ventral energy is used as a survival energy or is, is that just the, uh, the social engagement yeah, that the, switches it, to that? Yeah, um, it, it's a, even. it's a lovely question that, that I think more research is, is needed and, and is beginning to happen. We have some hypotheses. I don't think we have the research yet to, to back it up. But, you know, if we think about um, clients who are compliant, mm -hmm. right, compliance is not a ventral experience. Yeah. They're not doing it because they're, there's a willingness or a, or a desire. They're doing it out of a need. And again, anytime we say I have to or I need to or I should, that's not ventral. That's a survival response. So, you know, um, appeasement, and Steve talks about he, what he sees as appeasement. I, I, I have to appease this other person because they're dangerous to me, mm. right? And so 
the social engagement system gets used, mm -hmm. but not from a place of ventral safety and a connection, but from a place of survival. I have to make sure that that other person does not see me as dangerous or else I will be hurt. Yeah. You know, that's appeasement and, and the, the whole language, you know, language is important. Appeasement feels very different than fawn. Yeah. Right. It just has a very different flavor to it. Appeasement is like there's an I am actively doing something to survive. Fawn feels more like a submit submission sort of experience. And for um, people who have survived, you know, hostage situations, torture situations, these sorts of things the word fawn is so foreign to yeah. what their experience was and that's why appeasement you know is is a word that we're we're using now yeah yeah um there's uh, on the polyvagal institute uh, there's a two hour discussion with dr porges yeah. and uh, and Re rebecca, rebecca. Uh, yeah, yeah i can't remember the rebecca uh, bailey and jc dugard i think just, yes. yes it's yeah. it's it's a free yeah. it's a free two hour anyone can log in and it talks about that but yeah. because you know um and that's definitely not based on any scientific or backed up research you know women tend you know i find it it's more you know it happens more of smiling and it's happens from you know childhood smile and say thank you mm -hmm. uh you know you right. something happens and you just want to be the 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 good girl mm -hmm. syndrome if i want to put it yeah. that way yeah. that is you know to me feels like using that social engagement of you know i i need to smile and say okay mm -hmm. because otherwise something right. else would happen right right and so that's that's teaching you know, if we think about kids, we teach kids to not listen to, not respect what their nervous system is telling them. And it's because we get dysregulated around it, right? You know, I need my child to smile and say thank you, because if they don't, something's <laughs> going to happen to me, right? Rather than saying, oh, what is your nervous system telling you, right? You know, we, we tell kids to, you know, go, go kiss your grandmother goodbye i don't want to go kiss your grandmother goodbye when their nervous system is saying no thank you all right we say but do it anyway we're teaching them to override and not listen to what their nervous system is telling them and then as as adults they end up in therapy and we're trying to teach them to listen to what their nervous system is telling them right just because i listen doesn't mean i'm always going to do what my nervous system says there are moments when my nervous system says this is dangerous and I know I have to do it anyway. Yeah. And I'm gonna find a way to honor, I hear you, I know, I hear what's happening and I've got to reach for some resources so I can do it, right? So it's, it's not a just listen and do, it's a listen so that you have the information and then you can figure out what do I do from yeah. an intentional place. Um, yeah, I just saw a question I put, which is a, quite an interesting uh, one. Um, is how much do we know about how these autonomic states show up in utero? Yeah, you know, it it's interesting. And, and I think there is some research on what happens um, for um, babies when a mom um, has had a, a pregnancy where they're anxious and where they're depressed. We do have, there is a bit of research around that. I think what we would say is, a, a, a little one might come into the world with a sensitivity toward certain kinds of dysregulation depending on the in utero environment. But I don't think it's a, you know, your, your mom was depressed, you're gonna be depressed. It doesn't work that way. There may be more of a sensitivity, more of a leaning towards some kind of dysregulation. But again, the nervous system is shaped every moment. Right? That's the joy of polyvagal theory. That's the hopefulness of it that, yes, I might be a person who's stuck in this survival pattern, but every single experience I'm having now is continuing to reshape that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing. I think if, 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 it, if that's not the case, if that doesn't happen, then we're just doomed. We're, we're done. Let's just... <laughs> Stop we are older. never doomed we're never doomed <laughs> I, I i and and it's 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 really um you know i keep you know it's, it's magic because it's very because i've seen it especially with 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 children once the adult me have you know found my ventral and found that um you know a place 
enough ventral end meat that they could, you know, help to co-regulate. And maybe we have a little bit of time of, of co talking about co-regulation mm -hmm. because we do live in a culture and the, the self-development world and the therapy world talks about self-regulation and self-regulation. These are the things that you need to do. And there's an emphasis on the individual yeah. where it's, you know, you know, we're almost always in co-regulation with, you know, a thing or, or something. And um, that doesn't, you know, doesn't happen with that. Self-regulation doesn't happen without that co-regulation. Right, right. You know, we, we are, co-regulation is a biological imperative. You know, there, there are some of these words I just love, biological imperative, I love. It means we have to have it to survive. Right? We come into the world, we can't survive by ourselves. We can't self-regulate and survive. Impossible to do. And then over the course of our entire lifetime, you know, we need others, safe others, in order to fully experience well-being, to thrive in our lives. We need to co-regulate with others. And you know, it might be one other you need, or you might want 10 others. There's no set number, but we need other people to co-regulate. We also co-regulate with nature. Yeah. Right. And with spirit. Right. So there is that, too. But we need living, breathing nervous systems to to yeah. be in safe connection with. And, you know, developmentally, we're supposed to co-regulate first. Mm -hmm. And then when we have enough safe co-regulation, we venture out into the world and we learn to self-regulate. But for so many of us, that was backwards. Yeah. There was no predictably safe person to co-regulate with. We had to self-regulate for survival. Yes. Right. And yes. then it becomes a survival energy rather than a nourishing energy. Oh, that was a turning point for me when um, I was uh, reading uh, Kathy Kane's book and she talks about, you know, self-regulation uh, as a survival. And I realized, oh, my goodness, all these practices that I have been doing, you know, thinking that it's self-regulation, it, it's coming from. I have to, and maybe at some point in life, you know, especially as a mother with children, there are times where there's no space of, you know, breathing room. I need to be regulated or at least seemed like regulated. Uh, <laughs> but that's a very, it feels very different now from self-regulation in, uh, in ventral. Yeah. And I just want to bring in when, because of, the question on neutral mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, prematurity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. having to come into this world without, you know, because my second son was, was, was premature. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I look at his nervous system, yeah. that, it, you know, how does that impact? And, and thank God for, for, you know, reshaping and all of, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. ventral that, you know, I hope it helped him enough. But how is that also important for, you know, neonatal care and, mm. you know, having that because the nervous system is already compromised. Is no, not well, well, when we come into the world early, the ventral vagus hasn't had a chance to myelinate. So it's not ready to do its job of suck, swallow, breathe. That's yeah. its first job. Right. And, okay. and so that's why, you know, we have machines and, and things that help little ones do that because all they have is a sympathetic system that helps them mobilize and a dorsal system that takes care of, you know, immobilizing. They don't have the ventral to regulate, right? The, the, the good news is, you know, that, that um, we build that, you know, that the ventral vagus myelinates and we build it and we, be, we learn how to socially engage and all of that can, you know, be taken care of as we grow. And I think the thing that's so important nowadays in, in, in neonatal intensive care units is that we understand the importance of touch so early. Yeah. And so they do kangaroo care nowadays. As soon as a little one is safe to be out of an incubator, they put them on, you know, skin to skin with a mom, with a dad. You know, and I, I was talking with someone earlier today who, you know, if she was my age. That didn't happen. You know, we were we were lucky if we survived coming into the world early, but they survived. She was talking about a um, someone, one of her friends who spent six months in an incubator because there was, you know, that's survived and has, you know, overcome a lot. But, you know, we, we've learned. We've learned what the nervous system needs and it needs skin to skin contact. It needs to be held by a regulated nervous system. Yeah. yeah. 
I was lucky and privileged to be able to provide that. And I can't imagine how mm -hmm. looking back now, how the nervous system would have been, you know, completely, you know, just, you know, dysregulated, but yeah, it's, it's affirming and, um, you know, that it can build. And mm -hmm. I've noticed, and I'm sure everyone who had tapped into your work of, you know, uh, anchoring in ventral, finding those glimmers um, and, you know, moments of ventral that really builds the capacity to to have more. And I think, um, you know, even because I, I do work with parents, at, uh, well, not any not a lot now, but anyway, um, talking to the primary caretaker and I because I'm one. You know, and I, I remember um, Steve's uh, word, you know, we could be good enough co-regulators. Exactly. Good enough. Yep. I'm good enough. But but for a caretaker or a parent to be good enough co-regulator, they need to have their moments of ventral, their mm -hmm. self-care, their capacity, yes. the more ventral they can bring in. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at the time and we're coming to time of this, you know, you know, I could talk to you for another few hours, but <laughs> you have much more, you know, other things to do. Uh, that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the foundation, the uh, course, the foundation of polyvagal informed mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. and what could could I? I've done it last year, and I'm I'm quite excited and lucky to be a consultant on mm -hmm. the one coming uh, starting on um, Friday. And there is, you know, UK time and there's a, a US time. But can you say a little bit about that and why it's useful? Yeah. I yeah, find it useful. <laughs> yeah, Foundations was born out of, I, I was doing shorter workshops and people kept wanting to know, well, what do I do next? And what do I do next? And so Foundations is a six month program that really takes you through, you know, a, a true course of understanding your nervous system and having lots of tools to regulate your nervous system and then use those tools with clients. So, um, you know, I'm just starting to get ready to, to offer a, 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 a masterclass immersion, which really would be polyvagal sessions, seeing, you know, really, you know, feeling the flow of sessions. Foundations is the lead into that. Foundations gives you all the tools to help clients um, understand the nervous system to to really use in session, either as a standalone or, or along with um, other um, therapy models. And I think it is, you know, whether you're a clinician, most people who take it are clinicians, but, you know, it's also about, you know, how, how do I know my own nervous system? And then how do I help others know theirs? So, so yeah, I, I think Foundations has been, the feedback I get, it's been going on for several years now, is that, that um, it kind of changes not only the way you practice, but the way you live, right? And that's really what I hope happens. It's because polyvagal theory is not about a therapy model. It's about an approach to therapy and it's about the way you move through your daily life. Yeah. 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 It, uh, it is. It changed um, a lot and clarified. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's having, you know, self compassion, compassion for others, having, you know, uh, it, it really all cross board. It made my relationships with other people mm -hmm. much easier. Not that I don't get dysregulated and in go into the stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that for a minute because it's important to to say that out loud. To say that that it is the common, expected, normal experience to dysregulate many times a day for all of us. None of us are anchored in ventral all the time. It's unachievable. It's, we don't want to do that. You know what we want to do is know when am I getting pulled out and how do I find my way back. That makes for for well being. The flexibility to dysregulate and return to regulation that's resilience, right? So that's what we're looking for. So yes, I'm thinking about my day to day and I can think, oh, I've, I've traveled down and up the ladder a few times already. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm human. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. And, and Deb, uh, if anyone wants to reach, uh, reach you, uh, what, what's the best way of doing that? Um, go to the website, rhythmofregulation.com, and there's an email. You can send me an email and I'll get it, and, and that would be lovely. It would be lovely to hear from people. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deb, for the conversation and time and the ventral energy that I felt coming my way. I hope everyone uh, also felt that. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll send you the video when, once it's translated, and hopefully Great. it's a start for many things uh, to happen. 
I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for spending some time together today. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank Bye -bye. you. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye.